Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ask him a question, though, he's listening. He's listening. I'm, 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 I'm locked. I feel locked. Okay. <laughs> Three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to A Hoops Journey. Um, we're going to go back down memory lane again here with uh, one of the most prolific scorers I think our province, British Columbia, has seen, maybe forgot about. So let's bring it back a little bit. A guy who I'm really excited to uh, chat a little bit more with because I was always impressed as a coach, a young coach, by his his work ethic and his ability to get things done on the court for a guy of his size and stature, I know he's got a fiery, uh, you know, feisty attitude and, and, a, and a hardworking demeanor. And, and uh, this guy worked his ass off to get where he where he did um, and is currently former JUCO first team All American, led the nation in scoring. Kind of got the Hansworth program. I don't know if he'll admit it or not. Sort of rolling, and which led to a lot of success for them after his time there. Played Division One at Utah, led the team to. Uh, you know, a tournament spot and uh, led his team in scoring and their appearance there. And triple OG, as we like to say on the show, we're super, super excited to have one of North Shore's finest, Mr. Tyler Kepke. How are you doing, sir? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the uh, kind words and introduction. So uh, I'm happy to be here. You got it, man. Um, you don't know this, but my introduction to you was my my first year at STM, and I saw that Hansworth was playing uh, New West, oh. and ST, STM is just across the street, and they had... In New West, right? Yeah. They had Herman. Was it Herman was his name? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I went, and I was like, ah, I want to see this like Rob Sacre kid or whatever. And then all I could do, I was like, who in the hell is this little <laughs> yeah. bulldog out here? You know, I remember that game, actually. Yeah. I remember I had a big game. Yeah, I had a big game that game. I think I had like 35 or 40, I remember. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I remember okay, that, so I remember that game one. for some reason. Yeah, for some reason that I remember that game. I don't know why, but I do. I remember it, too, because I was like, holy crap, this guy's going nuts. So I'm excited, you know, still coaching the high school game and and love hearing different stories and love. We've got a few young people that listen to the show, so I think there's going to be lots of takeaways today. Let's check in with you. I know when we texted last week, things were not in a good spot with your season, but where are you at? Tell the people where you are. You know, you're 16 hours ahead. Yeah, and- so, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in Hong Kong. I've been here now uh, eight and a half, nine years. I'm actually later today going to uh, pick up my permanent residency card here. So I'm a permanent Damn. citizen now of... Uh, a permanent resident, sorry, of Hong Kong now. Which, uh, yeah, thank you. It's uh, so. We're just curious, what does that do? Like, what does that mean? Is it basically that means that I don't need a visa to work here to do anything? I'm free to do come and go as I please. You just have to come basically once every three years at least to like keep it. So uh, yeah, it's a it's a good thing to have. You know, um, <clears throat> makes life easier, and uh, you know a lot of people see it as an accomplishment so you know i'm happy to take it so yeah so i'm in hong kong been here that that amount of time i've been playing here the whole time still playing things kind of got derailed again this year because you know hong kong's pretty strict with uh the whole covid situation so as soon as there's a little bit of anything happening here they kind of lock things down in terms of you know gyms and all those things so we're on a bit of a standstill again after you know missing 2020 and then we started up this year in september october and then yeah this happened so we just got to take a couple week hiatus you know still stay in shape and work out while we can you know here and there and we'll see what happens and one of the things i want to dive into you with with you today is like just your mentality so just talk quickly about in terms of your mentality right now so we've all been going through this in different levels no matter what we do as educators like myself or whatever it is you do how do you get by day to day is it a goal setting thing are there stickies on the walls um is it just Um, sort of a yeah this is the point is it routine or how, how do you do it for me it's like i don't know i think some people it's ingrained and you know it stems back to you know, the time I was probably 10, 11, 12 years old with basketball. And, you know, I've always just kind of been regimented and structured, right? And it's just like, I've built the habits of always having a plan and then following the plan. And, you know, at this point, you know, being turning 35 now in, uh, in June, you know, I kind of know what works for me, what doesn't work for me. So, you know, I don't need a lot to get in good workouts and everything. I can work out, you know, in a weight room outside, 
on a basketball court or with no court. And uh, I kind of know what I need to make sure I stay at my level that I need to be. And, you know, for me at this point, it's all about keeping the things working and fine tuned and mostly about injury prevention, right? <laughs> and making sure the body's always ready because, you know, 35 and it's been a lot of wear and tear. And the way that I play is, uh, you know, quite dynamic and attacking. Like I'm always on the gas. I'm never stopping. So I got to make sure that everything's, you know, prepared. So that's kind of what I focus on. And let's talk about that journey, man. Take us back to you as a young guy, 30, well, let's say 30-ish years ago, and what life was like for you, kind of, you know, were you an active guy, where you grew up, and sort of when did basketball really start to, you know, start to come around for you? I grew up in North Vancouver. I was skating on the ice by the time I was three years old. You know, my dad put me on skates. Uh, Definitely started as a hockey player. Was a better hockey player than basketball player. You know, a lot of people know that. I was definitely born to play hockey as opposed to basketball and then you know growing up I played everything from basketball hockey soccer Uh, lacrosse was another big sport of mine so I played a lot of lacrosse and then you know I was playing I enjoyed them all you know from the time I was probably like five until 11 12 you know after school was just sports right from like literally three until eight or nine and you know in the mornings we'd practice you know I'd have hockey practice in the morning before school and then after school was just sports 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 as I got older, probably like in elementary school, by about grade five, I started playing more and more basketball, you know, at recess and whatever, and started just enjoying, you know, being able to play it all the time with my friends. I started playing it more and more, started going to the park with my dad playing, shooting. And then uh, by the time I hit 12, 13, um, you know, I was doing, which I'm sure you know, like 3D basketball, which is still around now. I don't know how well you know the name, uh, Glenn Chu. Of course. We have big Scotty Moe on the pod, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I listened I mean, to that one. But being a coach, you know, yeah, I mean, he was, you know, our guy was at their peak when I was starting to coach high school, right? Right, so, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, you, of course, know him. And so we started with a group, um, you know, there's 10, 12 of us. It was originally called the Jumpmen. And uh, <laughs> I think this was when I, it's 10, 11, 12. And, uh, you know, we just met three times a week two hours each time. And uh, we just started working on skill work. Right. And, and really like Glenn was teaching us all footwork and shooting and how to build our skills and foundation. And, you know, even when we were 10, 11, we rarely played five on five. Right. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we did a lot of two on two, a lot of three on three, a lot of one on one stuff. That's when I kind of started to fall in love with the game was you didn't need an ice rink. You didn't need hockey gear. You didn't need all those things. You just needed a ball. And, 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 then, and then it was limitless on like what you could work on, how you could work on it, and the creativity that came with it. After doing that, when it was like 10, 11, 12, then I got to the age where it was basically as a hockey player, you have to decide. Do you want to go billet and go play junior? You know, you're around 15, 14, 15 years old. Do you want to go do that path? Or it was like, <clears throat> do you want to focus on basketball, which, you know what? Number one, I fell in love with the game and like how to, you know, the training and the process of the game. Second, I fell in love with the fact that no one thought I could be very good. That's all I needed for him to do that. And it it became personal with me. Because of, you know, (laughs) me not looking like your prototypical basketball player. So that was highly motivating for me. I wanted to be like, you know, I started getting a little better. And then, but then I was like, you know, I think you know, I could be pretty good. So that was another aspect. And then lastly, was just the social part of it that, you know, we started playing in front of more and more crowds around my family, my friends at school, and that became enjoyable as well, right? Mm -hmm. What was it about the mentality early? Was it it was it a family upbringing thing? Was it guys that you followed and wanted to be like, I don't know, were you just a competitive guy in everything that you did? Yeah, so that's funny. And, And Glenn, he's told many stories, and he can attest to this. I mean, Even from the time I was 10 years old, Glenn had to like calm me down a little bit (laughs) because it was just like, I just loved to win, you know, and it wasn't to, you know, embarrass anyone else or to do anything, but it's just like, I just had this psychotically competitive mindset, you Mm -hmm. know, from a very young age. I mean, I don't know where I got it from. People thought like my parents pushed me and stuff like that, but my parents, they supported me a hundred percent, but they never pushed me to play any sports or do anything. Like I knew from the time I was three, I wanted to be an athlete. Like I literally knew that the first time I was on the ice and started playing different sports. Like I knew I wanted to be an athlete and that's just what it was going to be. I don't know why or how that happened, but that's how it was. And I've always just been psychotically competitive. Yeah. 
that's just how it is. I love how you touch on too, just that social aspect of it too, right? Where one, it's a thing where, all right, I don't need any homies to go get better. I can still do this on my own. But also when you are hooping and you go to, you know, you go down to Ambleside and get a run in yeah. and it's like, you know, like it's, it's a fun time, right? Playing mm-hmm. and competing and it's, and it is a community thing and it is social, right? And, and I think that's a huge connection for a lot of guys that, and girls that end up playing hoops. Yeah, no, for sure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And let's talk about your time at Hansworth. I mean, mentioned in the start, we have this huge, uh, Corbs bought this. It's like the 75th anniversary. Like it's like this thick. So it's got every year title, like 75 years was, um, the last year they hosted the tournament before COVID. Right. And so was looking it up and was seeing and, and saw that it was your senior year where you guys finally cracked the tournament and, um, Oh yeah. And made the semi, but I mean, but let's go back. Like, let's, let's go back and talk about just how damn competitive the North shore was. We don't need to talk about like, Okay, we got screwed over. We got screwed over on some birthing oh, yeah. every year. Okay, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, but like you know, and we're talking about no. So I was going to yeah. first start with what you mentioned in your introduction about how I kind of helped uh, pave the way for Hansworth. I mean, let's start when I was in grade eight. So I'll throw some guys out there. When I was in grade eight, you know, there's some guys, Jamie Hudson. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that name. Evan Southern, mm-hmm. who these guys were playing on the senior team. They were in grade twelve, grade eleven, and twelve at the time. I started playing, played grade eight, but I met them. Uh, Ryan Leonard Doozy as well. Of not course. Sure if that. Yeah. yeah. So still doing his thing, coaching and stuff out here. Yeah. 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 So, you yeah. know, those guys kind of took me under their wing um, when I was in grade eight and outside of practice with my grade eight team, you know, I was playing with those guys all the time, whether we're shooting, playing one-on-one, two-on-two. And uh, that, you know, in grade eight, yeah, I'd say that's when I was 13, that's kind of what really got me going, right? Because mm-hmm. I loved competing against the older guys. All Say, it again. And then, Say it again for the people in the back. You loved what? I loved competing against the older <laughs> guys. You know, that was like... So not guys that you were better than or that uh, were younger than you? Like, oh, yeah, well, interesting. Yeah, funny. No, okay. no, no, no. It was uh, 100% pro- the most enjoyable was being a young guy, playing with older guys, and then learning how to play against guys who are bigger, stronger, faster than you, right? I mean, that's the biggest thing that I think young guys got to do, you know, is you have to learn how to play when you're at a disadvantage. It's very important. So, yeah, that kind of set the foundation. And then uh, after grade eight and grade nine, um, by the time I was in grade nine and I was playing with those guys, you know, a couple of them were in the first year university, but, you know, they'll tell you, like, I was pretty much getting as good as them by grade Mm -hmm. nine, right? They, They were having a hard time dealing with me and our two and two and three on three battles and in grade nine I played up into grade 10 so I played uh junior and started doing really well and then grade 10 you know played senior from grade 10 11 12 and uh it just kind of yeah just snowballed I guess and I mean everyone just knew me for my work ethic um I in that time I played on the provincial team the U17 as a younger guy I made it like a year younger or whatever, I played U17 for a couple of years. I was a first team all Canadian at the Nationals or whatever. And then it just, yeah, I, it all just started going, you know, mm-hmm. had a pretty good high school career and it was just a lot of work, you know, and work that I enjoyed. You know, I just yeah. loved being in the gym. I loved, you know, a big thing that I'll tell the young guys is like, you have to study guys, watch guys try things, learn things, find the best way for you to train things, right? Because there's so many, now it's different, right? Like you have, <laughs> you have so much content, YouTube, all these things. Back then you didn't have that, right? So like I had VHS tapes and I was just watching Allen Iverson and Steve mm-hmm. Nash and all these things and Ray Allen and watching how they shot, watching how they moved, watching how they created space, you know, things like this and then going out, trying it and then figuring out what worked for me and how to train right? Mm-hmm. That's a big thing. A lot of people don't know how to train themselves. And that's kind of what I really built throughout high school was uh, an obsession with that and kind of figured it out. I think too, when I'm like just hearing you talk and then thinking about your game as like, I just like picture you like now in high school, like your game now and what the way the game is now. Do you ever think about that? Like how the game yeah, cha- has changed? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I haven't watched too much like high school, especially in North Van or in Vancouver, mm-hmm. just because I've been gone for so much. I mean, you see these kids on the internet that are like 15, 16, and, and they're they're freakishly athletic, and, you know, they don't look human anymore. But, uh, you know, I, I just think the biggest thing, and I think it's across the board is, and, you know, everyone will attest to it, is there's definitely a, a culture change now. 
I don't want to say it's not as competitive, but everyone seems to just be a little nicer. You know, everyone's a little more PC now, if, if that's what you want to call it, right? Yep. And, uh, you know, even here I run my academy and we do those things and you, you just see that everyone's a little nicer now. Yeah. It's, uh, it's different. So, yeah, I think, you know, if I was playing now, um, I'd probably have a lot of fun. It'd be, it'd be a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Savage. It's true, though. I try to tell the kids we coach, it's like, you can go after each other and still go to Subway after, man. It's fine. Like, oh, yeah, You can get exactly, into a fight with yeah. someone on the court and, like, it's all good. Oh, I mean, even in 3D, you know, we grew, you know, I was playing with Kevin Shaw and Sean Burke and those guys. And, like, yep. they, like you said, they were Argyle. And then it was basically just me at Hansworth from that main group of 3D guys, right? Mm-hmm. And Argyle had everyone, Sinclair, Ben, Kevin, Sean. And, I mean... In 3D practices, Sean and I, we got into a couple scuffles here and there, and, you know, it's just part of, it's just part of it. Yeah, 100%, man. And um, was Coach Story, or did you have Randy the yeah. all three years? Yeah. Yeah, so Coach Story was all three years, and he was great. And, great uh, guy, you know, man. He really, he really, which is I think is a big thing for players, is like when you have a coach that embraces you and, like, really believes in you, I mean, it's – it's the ultimate thing for a player and it can elevate a player above like what his actual physical ability is. Right. And coach story did that for me. He believed in me from day one. He embraced me and he just let me go. That's huge. And then, you know, by your senior year, you got some, some guys around you, right? You got Quinn, you got big Robbie, yeah. you know, you got some guys, I can't remember. You got Cam, uh, Cam Mowat. Yeah. Cam Mowat. Cam Mowat. He was the, the red guy. A, yeah. Did you have a decent little like two guard? Well, we had Digby, which was Scott Lee's oh, yeah. brother. Oh, that's right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then Scott okay. Lee as well. So then once right. Digby graduated, then oh, yeah, Scott Scotty. Lee. So yeah, no, right. we had a solid team for sure. Yeah. We had a solid and then team. You, every... And you ran into the White the White Rock Dynasty, right, at the old Agrodome and, you know, first team yeah, all-star. I mean, <clears throat> the bit, yeah, that was a little frustrating um, there because, uh, yeah, we just didn't, we just had a bad game, to be honest. Uh, mm-hmm. I remember that. We just, you know, just nothing worked that day as a team. How was that experience, though, to finally make the Dome in your senior year, right? Just battling to get off the shore all those years. I think you were a grade 10 or 11 Argyle one at one year. Like you, It's not like you're so, sitting there losing to some chump squads, right? Like you're. Well, no, I mean, we were one and two, us and Argyle were. I mm-hmm. mean, I was in grade 11 and I think in grade 12 as well, right? And because mm-hmm. Argyle in grade 12, they got upset in the first round by uh, right. Wellington. Right, from uh, the island. Okay. And uh, but when I was in grade eleven, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know how familiar you are with it, but like that was the legendary battles of like the playoffs of the North Best Shore three, with, right? us and, with us in Argyle <clears throat> and that game where Scott Morrison snapped the rim off, went to overtime. We ended up losing, and that's when we still only had one berth. But like. That game, in a lot of people's minds, was one of the best games that was ever played, you know, in BC history, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was battles, like serious battles, and it was super fun, you know, just crowded gyms. They had to turn people away from the gyms, you know, it was good times. Mm -hmm. And within all that, where are you finding the time to focus on kind of the recruiting process, post-secondary, as you say. And I think this is the cool part of your story. I know that there's going to be some some good stuff here, man. So I'm, I should have brought some popcorn, but... A lot, of, a lot of, yeah, I mean, this is where it kind of gets interesting. So I didn't have any recruiting process, right, mm-hmm. at zero. Mm-hmm. You know, UBC, I was going to go to UBC. Kevin, mm-hmm. you know, I got recruited by some Canadian schools, whatever. Kevin recruited me, and I was going to go, okay? Mm-hmm. And then I think, you know... I still don't know 100%, but I mean, this is the only reasonable explanation, is a school that was recruiting Rob saw me and passed my name to a junior college and said, hey, they have this kid, he's pretty good. We don't know if, you know, what level he's at. Maybe you guys should take a call, you know, call him, Mm -hmm. see what's going on. I think Mm -hmm. that's what happened. I mean, it's the only explanation I have. I still don't know. Like, it's the only thing that makes sense. So I get a call from this New Yorker called named Brock Erickson, who's still one of my favorite coaches of all time. Real smooth talker, salesman. Basically, the conversation to sum up goes, listen, you're a Canadian and you're a <laughs> So if you want to prove yourself, we, we, we can't fly you down here on, you know, and give you an official visit and stuff. We're a small JUCO in Utah, but we, we play. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying. Oh. We play in like the, if not the top, the top two or three, you know, JUCO conferences in America. It's all serious Div 1 guys, guys that are going to be Division 1 or Div 1 transfers. 
if you're not a come prove yourself. It's basically what it was. So then I sat there for a minute and because I didn't write to tell you this part yet, but I think when I was 13, I wrote down my list of goals. One was for high school and then it was play division one basketball, play for team Canada, play in the NBA. So, you know, achieve most of them except one, which is pretty good. But yeah, so I sat there and was like, well, if I want to play Division One, it's not going to happen if I go to UBC. So I got to go test it out. So I remember I said, all right, <laughs> done. I'm going to come, right? I'm going to go. Is this the same I'd league make... as like Snow College and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sorry, guys. like Mav- Andrew Mavis went there and then like um, yeah. Yeah. A, a guy that I played high school with, he went to one of the JUCOs in the same <clears> league. Like that was the league that was... Yeah. yeah, no, it's solid. I mean, Southern Idaho, which is in that league, they're like the, you know, at the time when, you know, we were going, when I was growing up, they're like the Duke of Jucos. Like, okay. they have 12 guys that are either high major transfers and, mm-hmm. you know, their top 10 guys are going high major, whether they're transferring in or they have to go there because, you know, they didn't qualify out of high school or whatever. But like some of the most athletic guys I've ever played against mm-hmm. were mm-hmm. in that league. Freakishly athletic people. So anyways, after that phone call with Brock, I had to make the phone call to Kevin, right? And, uh, you know, I called him and said, you know what? I'm really sorry. Because, like, this was literally a month before school. Okay. Yeah, it was very quick. Told him I wasn't going to come. And uh, I think he's over it now. But I know he was uh, <laughs> a little disappointed at the time, which he should be. And, you know, like many people, they're like, oh, you know, he's probably not going to have a chance. He'll be back in a year. And, you know, because at that point, you know, Canadians going down just didn't have a good track record at yep. all. And especially, you know, I'm going to JUCO, which come to find out actually is a much tougher path than, you know, just living wise and everything else associated with it than if you go straight into Division One, right? Mm-hmm. I think at that time, you could probably count on one hand how many guys are playing like, you know, mid to high major Division One and actually playing significant minutes from Canada. I think it was only, you could count on one hand. My dad and I, my mom, we, he packed up the car and we drove down to Utah. Yeah, okay? you did. Yeah, you did. So uh, <laughs> we drive down there and we get to Salt Lake. And I'm like, oh, are we here? I'm thinking Salt Lake is like where it is. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, no, no, no. We got another two hours through this canyon, all this stuff. I'm like, Jesus. So we get through. We keep going. We get there. <clears throat> and there's a Walmart. There's a gas station. There's a Taco Bell. And that's about it. Make a run for the border, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm getting out of the car. I'm like, what am I getting myself into, right? Coming from North Vancouver, like, yeah, you know. One of the most beautiful different. places in the entire yeah. world, yeah. Yeah, a little different. So uh, we get out, start, you know, whatever. And, you know, again, it's, it's just a completely different environment. And then I remember, I think it's the second day I'm there. My parents stayed for a couple days. Second day I'm there, coach calls us in. And uh, he's like, we're having our team meeting. It's the team meeting they have every year, the beginning of the year. So I walk in the room and there's 30 guys in there. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what? How is it? There are 30 people here, right? And he's like, he walks in. He's like, some of you might be looking around and wondering how there's 30 people here. And he goes, some of you are on scholarship, right? So like, that was me. I was on a full scholarship there. <clears throat> Other guys, but he's like, That doesn't mean anything because if someone's in here that's not on scholarship and he outplays you, I'm going to take your scholarship away and that person's going to get it. And (laughs) there's going to be – and then he goes – and then he's like, there's also 30 of you in here because every year we have this meeting. And he literally drops this booklet that's probably 80 pages thick on every player's lap. And we sat there for five hours, go through it, and it's basically – Everything you're allowed to do, what you can't do, you know, it's junior college. You have some wild guys, right? 100%. So, yeah. You know, you have to go through this protocol and he's like, and some of you are going to start dropping like flies because we're going to go through this booklet and I'm going to tell you something you can't do. And guess what? Some of you are going to do it and you're going to get kicked out of school. So that was like my second day on campus. And I'm like, what is going on here? Right. And I'm only 17, 18 years old, you know, yeah. fresh yeah. out of North Vancouver. Like it's, it's a big adjustment. And you know, you have guys from some pretty rough areas, you know, from across America, and it's totally different environment. And we're not like, you're not old, but like, this is not like Instagram, cell phone, no, Twitter, there's Snapchat. Nothing. This is not like, people got to know not that enough. it's not, yeah, like you're in your residence, like 
No, you're you're in the residence and you, yeah. you basically in the dorm, you walk in and they're in pods and there's mm-hmm. four rooms to a pod, right? And then a bathroom on each end of the hall. So there's me, little white guy from North Vancouver, BC, my roommate, Brian Towner from Fifth Ward, Houston, Texas. Then you go hey, down. Yo. Next two guys from Newark, New Jersey. Okay. And you go to the far end of the hall. It's a guy from the Bronx and uh, another guy from somewhere in Florida. So let the games begin. Okay. <laughs> My first night sleeping there, you know, the music was shaking the walls till about 5 a.m. You know, these guys, they just don't sleep. They're partying and playing video games, whatever. But sure enough, just like Coach said, within two weeks, guys start dropping like flies. Okay. So it happened, start hey? cracking. Oh, yeah. like clockwork. Yeah. It's like yeah. clockwork. You, you wouldn't believe it. It's like clockwork. Mm. And then we start practice. And so my first year, the first month or two was a big adjustment. Just like the length, the athleticism. You can't practice that, right? You really can't practice. It doesn't matter what you do when your workouts, whatever, but you just can't prepare for the length and speed and all those things. So the first month or two was a big adjustment. And there was times I was like, man, I don't, you know, I don't know how this is going to go. <laughs> But, you know, it was the same thing, you know, me and a couple of my roommates or whatever, every night after practice, we're in there playing two on two, one on one, shooting. Before class, we started doing it. You find a way, right? So if I'm playing one on one with a six six athlete all the time, I'm going to learn how to get my shot up. I'm going to learn how to create space. I'm going to I'm going to learn how to use my body. You know, I'm going to find my advantages against them. Right. And then by about month three, right before the season started, started to figure it out a little bit. And then my first year, I actually went on to have a great year. I averaged 15 points and five assists. I was a starting point guard. Played against some big teams that had high-level Division One guys and did really well. Mm-hmm. So that kind of opened my eyes up a little bit. So by the end of my first year, I started getting recruited by some Division One schools, um, mm-hmm. smaller schools. And I'm, sure, I'm not sure if you've heard this story, but a lot of people have heard it. The main school that recruited me the hardest was Weber State. And uh, Randy Ray, who used he was coaching at Utah actually, and then he got the head job there. He was recruiting me very hard at the end of the year through the summer. Said, you know, you come here, you have three years of Division One. It's your show. The ball's in your hand ninety nine percent of the time. Damn. I'll backtrack to this point at, later in the story because the young people need to understand this. <laughs> I thought about it really hard, and then my coach at JUCO he supported me. He said, hey. If you want to go that, if you want to go to Weber State, I support you 100%. But he's like, I think that level school will always be there for you. I think you're going to have a big sophomore year. So if you still end up at that level, then fine. But I think if you come back, you know, things might be a little different. So I come back. I make the decision to come back. And at this point now, you know, I'm making a little name for myself. Everyone knows me that I'm in the gym all the time working my ass off. Well, this is what I was going to say is like that environment that could drive some people nuts or just boredom oh, and no. li- lead to trouble. You were just like, I'm going to lock myself in the gym. Yeah. Well, and don't get me wrong. This junior college was probably the funnest time in my career of playing basketball because all it was about was one goal, getting divi- to division one. Mm-hmm. You had a group of guys who everyone's goal was the same. We were all working together 24 seven. You had long bus rides, you know, 16 hours, eating McDonald's, like <laughs> every bar, everything about it was tough, but it was like the most enjoyable because it was just like the purest passion of the game for like one goal, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, I loved it. It was awesome. And I, I was making a name for myself and, and started doing really well. Get the other teams, you know, they'd see me after the game shooting with the assistant coach, like after a game in our home mm-hmm. games, right? Like it was just nonstop. So anyways, come back my second year and uh, we're rolling training camp. Everything's finishing. Oh, let me throw in there too. Christmas time. Mm-hmm. I didn't get to go home for, I mean, I went home for Christmas for only a couple days. Yeah. And then there'd always be like a two week lapse before the season would start up again in JUCO. Okay. So during those two weeks when we were off school and we'd be back on campus in the freezing cold snow in the middle of nowhere. And no, no other students. No other students. We were practicing twice a day. Okay. Twice yeah. a day. Three hours in the morning, three hours at night. And in these practices, same thing. Coach would say, I'm taking away scholarships today. Someone's losing one by the end of these two weeks. You guys are going to go after each other's necks. And you get hurt, you get hurt, you lose your scholarship. Like, it was full-on war for two weeks. I thrived in that environment. I definitely will say I did. 
Mm-hmm. But it was also – he wasn't an asshole coach where he belittled people. He was hard as hell mm-hmm. on people. But it was – you knew he still believed in you, right? And for me, he really – I've never had a coach believe in me more than him, right? Mm-hmm. Which translated into my second year. I come back. Is that is that why you stayed? Like you developed that trust and you and you, you, you took yeah, his – I mean because, you know, sometimes you get to that level and it's like, is he selling me something? Does he really have my best interest? But there obviously yeah. was some – there was some trust there, right? Yeah, no, there's definitely some trust there. I know he's mm-hmm. seen it before. And then he kind of – he also gave me advice – you get recruited and then you pick the top schools, the bottom schools, and you go somewhere in the middle in terms of like size of division one school. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause this is what he was saying to me at the beginning of my second year, because he knew I was, you know, the wave was about to come. Right. So I started the second year. First game I have like 35. I was like, Mm -hmm. Oh, that was nice. That happened. The next game, (laughs) the next game I have 40 next game. I have 28. And you remember, are you guys winning games too? Like you're yeah, yeah, oh no, we yeah. were, yeah, 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 we were, we were my, my second year, we finished like 26 and nine or something like that. Right. And then you have to remember when we were in conference, which our conference is very tough. You play back to back games. You're, you oh. play Friday, Saturday. That's like, like CIS, brutal. man. It's so hard. Same team so hard. or different teams? Same team. No, same oh. team. Same team. Is there nothing harder? Like the, the Saturday night on the road is like, come on, man. Yeah. Like if you squeak went out on Friday, you were like, there's no way we're getting Saturday. You know, it's exactly it's hard, really hard. We And then when we got in the conference, like I didn't slow down. Right. So then we're playing at Salt Lake Community. And then now and then I think it was like around Christmas time. He's like he's looking at like the national NJC AA like website. And he goes, Tyler, you're leading the country in scoring. And I'm like, huh, really? Like I didn't even know at this point. Right. Mm. And And then he shows me the screen. Yeah, I was I was leading like by a fair margin, and I'm like, wow. And he's like, yeah, I had no idea either. But then, like by around Christmas time, when like kind of right when he showed me that, it was like recruitment started, right? Mm. And I actually had committed to Utah um, by about November. I already committed to them when Ray Jacoletti was the coach. Come in January, Ray Jacoletti gets fired. So then I reopened my recruitment. And then January, I'm rolling. Like, I'm going, we're going to Salt Lake Community College, back-to-back games. First night, I have 36. Second night, I have 38. And then literally in the gym behind our bench, there's literally 20 schools there to see me, right? And, like, San Diego State, every every major conference that takes JUCO guys, like, was represented there, right? Mm-hmm. So then, yeah, I just finished the year, roll and go to the, the national JUCO, like, All-American game whatever. And Marcus Thornton was there who actually had a pretty good NBA career, you know, and I remember walking into the gym at the all-star game. It was in Texas and everyone's like, we want to see who the leading scorer in the country is. (laughs) No, no, and you know, because like a lot of the players are from like the Texas leagues in Florida, which is also very good. Right. Yeah. So I walk in the gym and these guys could not believe it, that it was me leading the country and scoring, which was pretty funny. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, even by the end of the year, you know, like Jim Calhoun called my coach and, you know, wanted to recruit me. And I was like, well, I'm not like, that's, I'm not going to go to UConn. That's just not going to happen. This I'm I'm smarter than that, but you know, there's still the interest. Right. And like, when I say I was getting recruited, I'm talking about phone calls, handwritten letters, like real, not just, you know, printed letters that people would get. And by the time the spring came in my second year, I could barely go to class because there wasn't the regulation on the rules like as much as there is today like i was getting they're only allowed to they're supposed to only call you so much right okay i was getting phone calls six hours a day probably 500 to a thousand text messages a day my mail i'd go to my mailbox and the lady at the mail would hand me a big black garbage bag full of mail every day like literally every day i'd go there's full of mail you know, and I was like, this is getting ridiculous, right? Like it's, it's just getting crazy. And like the hard part was, is I didn't know anyone who ever went through this, right? Coming from mm-hmm. Canada, I had no real guidance on like this type of recruitment. And it became very hard because, you know, eventually everyone sounds the same, right? They're, yeah. all, they're all selling you, they're all selling you the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you, how do you filter through all that? It, I mean, it was very hard. So I took mm-hmm. my, my visits, you're allowed five official. I think I only took four. Um, But I ended up going to St. John's, visited St. John's, Big East, right? Uh, Visited Duquesne in the Atlantic 10 at the time. Visited San Diego State. It's pretty funny, you know, going to St. John's because like St. John's, the assistant, he flew to my house in Vancouver, came and had lunch with my family. Like, you know, these guys, 
go to all lengths. They all, the head coach of St. John's and all these schools came, you know, drove to Price, Utah, come see me, talk to me, right? Like when they recruit you, they recruit you very hard, right? Yeah. And then when you go on the visit, it's the whole dog and pony show and all this stuff, right? Dude, you get to playing in the garden, man, like that alone yeah. in their back pocket, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, the funny thing is, is I like, I met Lou Carnesecca, who's the legendary coach yeah. at St. John's, um, coach Chris Mullen and those guys, right? And I remember the coaches from St. John's being like, you know, we just need a really badass white player to come here and play. Like, we need one, right? And that was like their selling point, right? And they were not very good at the time. But they're mm-hmm. like, we need a badass white boy. Like, that's what we mm-hmm. need. So it was kind of fun, you know. But uh, so anyways, they were recruiting another like New York City high school point guard that committed to them as well. And I just knew like, I'm not going to go there and battle a New York City point guard. You know, I'm coming in with only two years left. So anyways, ended up, you know, doing it the best I could, ended up staying with Utah, which I ended up playing, you know, for probably one of the worst head coaches of all time, Jim Boylan, who, if you, I don't, you saw him with the Chicago Bulls, how hated he was with the Chicago Bulls. I don't know if you followed that at all, which was really recent, right? Yep. He's a good coach in terms of X's and O's in the game, but basketball is a people person sport. And Mm -hmm. when it comes to dealing with people, he was just awful. Yeah. So I ended up at Utah, had a decent career. You know, I had a great one because of my battles with him, you know, that's just flat out. You, you, and, you know, when you're only 20 years old, it, you're not mature enough to, like, understand a lot of things and how the best way to respond to things are. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. it was a total di- totally different environment from a coach that loved everything about me, embraced me, my work ethic, all these things, to a coach that was just trying to change everything about you, you know, and that it didn't even have to do with the basketball part. It had to do more with my personality and the way I worked and all these things, which, you know, was weird to me because it's like you knew what I was recruiting me and now you're trying to change me as soon as I step on campus. And that kind of set the tone for my career at Utah. And even Mm -hmm. though it was a decent career, I mean, I could have, you know, averaged 20 a game in Division One. You know, I averaged double figures my senior year, but, you know, I, I could have been a much more prolific player given the right situation, which brings me to full circle to what I said is if you're a small undersized guard, you have to go where you're going to have the ball in your hand and be able to showcase your skills on a nightly basis. Right. Mm. Most important thing, hands down Mm -hmm. coach that believes in you and that you're going to be able to have the ball because so when I got recruited by Duquesne, the attraction was Ron Everhart, the coach there. He coached JJ Berea at Northeastern before he came to Duquesne. And that was a very big comparison, right? Me mm-hmm. and JJ were a very similar game, right? And the only reason I didn't go there was because I went and visited Pittsburgh and it was just an absolute sh- I was like, I'm not living in Pittsburgh. So um, that, that's why I didn't go there. Shout out Levon Kendall. Yeah. Well, so University of Pitt. Pitt is outside of the actual city. Uh, Duquesne, okay. Duquesne is right in the city, right? And I probably didn't do it justice because I went there after visiting San Diego State and Utah, which have like beautiful facilities, massive arenas, the best weight rooms, you know, like, Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it probably didn't get a fair shake because of that. And then I went, and then after that, I went on to, you know, St. John's and went to the garden and all this. So, you know, but in terms of coach, and then secondly, rewinding the tape back to Weber State after my first year, when I said no, you know, who was second on their depth chart out of high school to go recruit and get? Dame Dollar. Dame Dollar. Yeah. Wow. I was going to ask. So I played against him my junior or senior year when he was a freshman, and we, we destroyed them. And he was he was not the player you see today. And then he broke his leg, sat out for a year, and came mm-hmm. back. And he was not, you know, a totally new player and, you know, made it, made it all happen, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that would have been me, but had I had three years of Division One. And the ball in my hand a lot, you know, it just makes a big difference. So, We want to take a moment and thank our sponsor, Parkside Brewery. Located in the heart of Port Moody on Brewers Row, Parkside offers an amazing atmosphere with one of the best summer patios around. If you can't make it to the brewery located at 2731 Murray Street, then hit any government retail store and try the Don Pilsner, the Dusk Pale Ale, or my favorite, the Dreamboat Hazy IPA. A Hoops Journey promises that the beer at Parkside is much, much, much better than the owner, Sam Payne's streaky jump shot. 
We hope to see you Parkside. After a brief hiatus, Goodlot Clothing has returned, but under a new location, 3283 Main Street is where they can be found. Name drop a hoops journey to get 10% off any clothing items in store. The store no longer offers barber, but you can find the best retail around. Thanks to our sponsor, Good Lad Clothing, and we hope to see you there. And so what was it about, like, Utah that, is it because you only had two years that you thought, okay, transferring again is just not worth it for one year? Or was it just like, uh, I'm going to try to prove this coach wrong? Like, how were you able to... Yeah, I mean, I almost did transfer. I did because of other Division One coaches that knew me from the recruiting process said, you know, I could come there. And yeah, after my first year, like it got pretty bad, just like emotionally and, and mentally, I was really over it. But I, I can't explain exactly why I didn't pull the trigger. And I mean, you know, I was on the floor 30 minutes a game and my senior year, I did what I had to do to be on the floor mm-hmm. for 30 minutes a game. But yeah, just I don't know why. Yeah, I just kind of toughed it out back then as times have changed now, you know. Now people are, you know, as you see with the NCAA, players are trying to find ways to get money. You know, they, there's more of the player being put forward more in college sports now, as opposed to back then, which like mm-hmm. you still felt powerless at times, right? It was a complete meat market. You didn't know how to navigate, right? You didn't have that type of support that the players have now. Um, it's just a different yeah. time. And uh, one thing that yeah. I... I, I I've reflected on over the years. I mean, I think it's different now because coaches can't be like how he was anymore because of, and I mean, you saw it with the guy at Rutgers when the videos came out, I'm sure you saw that him throwing balls and choking guys and stuff like that. That was a regular occurrence at Utah all the time. The things he would say, even with me, which had nothing to do with basketball, but he used to think I was selfish because I trained too much on my own. And it was like, Oh, you're selfish, right? Like this was the type of stuff he was throwing at me. As I reflected back on it, it's like these coaches at these high-level programs, they always talk about, oh, is he a good kid? Is he this or that? I think the coaches need to be verified as well by like a committee to be like, is this guy fit for dealing with 18, 19, 20-year-olds and helping them reach like the level Mm -hmm. they should? Because they have a big influence on their future, their path. And I think a lot of times these coaches, their egos are so big. There's so much money on the line. You know, they're allowed to get away with murder. But yet the players under all the scrutiny. Yeah, the coach might get fired, but the like the long term effects they might have on the player are never measured or taken into account, right? No, I make a good point. And you know, we had we had Jordy McTavish on the podcast, and he had a you know it's a pretty rough experience yeah. with Utah as well. And then um, I don't know if you know the name Brendan Graves. I don't know that name. He played at Cal, um, and then he went and transferred to Santa Clara and played with Nash. But, you know, his experience at Cal playing with Jay Kidd and these guys and just same thing, like kind of just never really felt like the coach was really truly cared about them yeah. as a human. You know, it was kind of just – it was just a very interesting experience and, and, and good reflection, Yeah, I mean, for right? me, I didn't need him to care about me as a human. I just more wanted – just like my JUCO coach to like embrace me for me and let me go because like – I'm not going to say I had a terrible career. I had a decent career. And I mean, like I had games at Utah. And I mean, the big problem was we had a guy called Luke Neville who was right after Andrew Bogut. So when Jim Boylan got his first head job as a head coach, which was Utah, his main goal was to have Utah be his first NBA guy or Luke to be his first NBA guy, right? Who was another 7-1 Australian guy. But Luke cared more about eating Skittles and playing Mario Kart than he did about the game. Okay. (laughs) What's wrong with nothing wrong with yeah, Mario mean, Kart? But that was his passion. <laughs> Basketball was not right, and it played out because every mm-hmm. time we played another major conference team like Oregon or Cal or Oklahoma, we played um, in the tournament Arizona, right? And we were a five seed. Like we were good. We were a five seed. Like that's the mm-hmm. highest seed mm-hmm. Utah's ever been in the NCAA tournament. I think still to date. Oh, and you know they've been to the Final Four mm-hmm. a couple times, um, but. Luke, every time we played those teams and we couldn't, he couldn't do what Luke does, you know, because we played through him through and through. But then all of a sudden when we played those big teams and Luke couldn't be Luke, then it was like, okay, Tyler, you know, and Sean and a couple other guys, let's go now. We'll, we'll let you guys go. And then my biggest games always came against the best teams, right? If you go look, you can go look. My highest scoring games are always against Oregon, Arizona, Cal. Like I always played best in those games where it was like, now the real players can play. We're not gonna, you can't just run through the system and throw it into a seven-foot guy who can go to a little baby hook every time, right? When he was playing against NBA-level mm-hmm. athletes, 
and he couldn't do that, I had my best game. And I mean, mm-hmm. even in conference, mm-hmm. like at Colorado State, I scored 28 points and a half in Division One with a 35-second shot clock. Not many mm-hmm. guys have been scored 28 points and a half in Division One with a 35-second mm-hmm. shot clock, right? Like the 35 is crazy too. That like yeah. the extra time. And there, so, yeah. you know, it's like for me, it's just frustrating because like. Well, it's not frustrating because I know I've I got myself to the level where, you know, any level in the world I can play at. I just wonder, had the path been a little different, what would have happened, right? And and that's why, you know, the title of the show, Hoops Journey, man, like there's so many ups yeah. and downs in between yeah, like, course, things that can happen and, and it's life experience. And I, and I appreciate the fact that you're using the word reflection because it's the only way we learn and grow, right? If we don't look yeah, yeah. back and realize what were those times like for me and how did I work through them? Then, you know, you know, the good, that's where the good stuff happens, but good insight, man. Good stories. Loving it. Before we move to the pro side of the ball, I just wanted, you talked about your checklist, right? Canada. Talk about that. Talk about getting an opportunity yeah, to, yeah. to, to rep the leaf and play, play for the, the, the country yeah, so, you grew up in must be pretty special, you know? Yeah, it was. Um, so after my first year at Utah, they invited me to training camp. So I was only, yeah, I was 19 at the time. And they invited me to training camp that first year after my first year of Utah. How many, and so I me, went out. Let me, let me, sorry, cut you off. How many guys were true freshmen like you that you played against? Were, were a lot of the guys. Oh, not yeah, many. Yeah, that's you what, mean in, in the it, States? It just clicked, in the States? Yeah, it just clicked in my head. Oh, no. That, yeah, you're a few and far I was between. 17, 18. Yeah. Like when I was a freshman, I was 17, 18. Yeah. These guys all were 19, 20, yeah. most of them. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, they were all older, right? So that was, yeah, I mean, you, one or two years makes a big difference at that oh, age. Massive difference, Oh, my right? God. Yeah. So, yeah, so I was 19, got invited to my first camp. And, you know, I went there just happy to be there, you know, type of thing. And then camp started, and uh, I just started doing well, you know, and, and, and playing well. And, you know, my team's... You know, I remember playing and, you know, doing really well in the scrimmages. Like, you know, they kept score and which teams was winning. And, you know, my team consistently was the winning team. Yeah, it just kind of happened. And then I remember after the two-week training camp or whatever, there was some media there or whatever. And, uh, and then they told me, they called me in the hotel room and said I made the final 12. And uh, so it was pretty, uh, yeah, it was pretty special, especially that first year. You know, I think not many guys in there, you know, 19, there hasn't been many that I played on the team. So, uh, you know, it was a great experience. Again, it's one of those things where it was great. And, you know, I played for three years to 2011, but, you know, I was so young. Right. And I was right before that wave of like all the NBA guys coming. Right. And then all the NBA guys came or whatever. But, uh, you know, I just played when I was so young. Um, but, you know, for the opportunity I got when I did play, I was very productive, you know, and I played against the EuroLeague guys, NBA guys, you know, the best guys in the world. And, you know, I always produced when I was on the court. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it was a fulfilling experience, met some great guys, uh, you know, Javon Shepard's still one of my good friends that I keep in contact with from that team. Trying to He's, get uh, him on the pod. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. We've been uh, in touch. See if We've been going help. back and forth, but yeah, please do. So, uh, yeah, we still text and that's an end of the, that's of an end of the show other. question. So you talk a lot. Of yeah. Day? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we just mess with each other. We have, you know, from our history together and, uh, you know, it's fun. I um, mean, you know, he's doing really well, doing his broadcasting. Yeah, he's up and coming with the national team. Yeah, yeah, he's, uh, you know, I call, I call him, he, he's, he's the real six god of Toronto. You know, I, I, I give him a hard time. <laughs> yeah, he's the king of Toronto, so um, you know, it's, it's funny. Love it, love it. Pro basketball. Yeah. So yeah. Again. You've got some cool experiences too, like you and Nate and Tommy and McLaughlin, yeah. these guys. Like, it's cool, man. I, if, it makes me just a little bit envious and jealous, right? Like, just being, you know, someone, I'm a grad of like 95, right? And it was like, how do you figure out how to play overseas? You know what I mean? And now, like, the options are like, it's so cool. So, talk a little yeah. bit all your experiences, you know, and the things that you've been able to do. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember I was in my last second year at the national team. We were playing in Puerto Rico in the world qualifiers. And, like, I was playing well. We're playing against Brazil, who had, like, Barbosa and Marcelo Huertes. I was playing for Barcelona at the time. And, like, I totally outplayed Huertes when we played them. We played against Argentina, who had, like, Prigioni and uh, Scola and those guys. Um, we played against Puerto Rico with Carlos Arroyo and those guys. And, you know, we had the big game when we won against Dominican Republic. who had a bunch of NBA guys like Charlie Villanueva. Now Horford was playing and all those guys. The same thing with my pro career kind of went how 
my Utah thing was. So like I thought I was going to go somewhere. And again, it was the process of like dealing with agents, right, which I had no experience with. And yeah, I was playing on the national team. But like it was just different. I was so young. These guys are a lot older. I haven't mm-hmm. really proved, you know, even though I was playing well in this international competition, I think, you know, for me being a small, small white guy, no passport, you know, and the way I played, right. Mm-hmm. I didn't play like most smaller undersized white players played like you know I just didn't you know I scored the ball I looked to score first I played the game and I think it was just hard for a lot of people to like see me doing that at higher levels you mean like they couldn't wrap their head around that that yeah that it would the success would continue like it was like okay yeah well, exactly like a flash right? in the pan yeah I got you oh yeah. I just mean like a, a high level professional team you know at the highest levels in Europe or whatever being like we're gonna take a chance on him mm. as opposed to just, you know got you yeah. And so the first, I should have signed with a European agent out of college, but I didn't. And then it ended up being a European agent I didn't sign with that actually helped me get my first job, which I went to Germany in the second division there. And, you know, it was like late, like late September because I was still waiting. I thought I was going to go to Israel from the agent I had, but it never ended up working out. So now I was kind of stuck. And, you know, I just got back from, you know, Puerto Rico, or whatever. And, Ended up going to the second division in Germany, an eye opener, you know, and then I had a good time and I ended up leading the league in scoring, right? And the mm-hmm. average like 23 a game or whatever, you know, we were in the middle of the pack of the league, but, you know, I made some great friends at a good time. And so that's kind of how it started. But the problem is, is like, again, this is before the social media, YouTube, all these things, right? Mm-hmm. Someone once told me, which is pretty true. I mean, there's a couple guys that like start off in, you know, even much lower levels than where I started and then work their way to the top levels in Europe in the Euro League and stuff. But you kind of generally wherever you enter is where you're going to hang around, give or take a little bit for the rest of your career, right? Mm-hmm. So anyways, then I just floated around the second division for the next three years and the first division. So I played in the Bundesliga in the first division in Germany, but same thing. It was like, and at that time you were allowed six Americans on your team, right? In Germany. Damn. Yeah. yeah, So a lot of foreign guys, right? Yeah. And it was the same thing. It was just like, oh, he led the second division in scoring, but like, is he going to be able to do that in the first division? And then I played the first division and, you know, would come in, you know, one year I came in like halfway through the year when a guy got hurt or whatever, and it was just the same story. Oh, will he be able to do this here? And I was playing in these roles where, you know, I was the new guy and I just wasn't, you know, getting into what I do. Right. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I had a good time in Germany. I was there for almost four years. So is, and it got, does it get tiring? Like, or do you keep feeding off it? Well, I mean, at this point it got down. tiring, right? Yeah. I was just so like, I mean, it, yeah. It was just, it was like, just, yo, <laughs> yeah. What else I got to do here? And, and then the thing was, is like, I was trying to get out of Germany. I wanted to go to Austria. I wanted to go to France. I really wanted to go to France to play because, uh, it's a much more up and down game in France. It's an athletic game. You know, mm-hmm. I really wanted to go there and play, you, you know, in the, even start in the second division or whatever, because just the game style. Right. And I mm-hmm. thought I would do really well. But I just for whatever reason, I couldn't go. And I mean, I remember playing against France at the time, the starting point guard of the national team, Jermaine, was hurt and we beat France. The only guy that wasn't playing for them, we played them in the ACC in Toronto, back to back games would beat them. The only guy that didn't play for them was Tony Parker, but everyone else was playing Ronnie Turiaf. Uh, Nicholas oh, Batum, Ronnie Turiaf, yeah. Boris Diaw, all those guys were playing. And I remember this guard who I was playing against, I had no idea who he was. And I remember pressuring the shit out of him. He could barely get the ball up over half, going by him, doing whatever I wanted. And then after the game, my agent at the time being like, do you know who you, that guard was you were playing against? He's like some 6'4 French guy. So no idea. Oh, that's Nando DiColo. He just got drafted 37th by the Spurs this year. And, you know, and now Nando, he's the last like five years, he's been like the MVP of the EuroLeague. He's been one of the top players in the EuroLeague. But I just remember that and then being like, this is just not making sense. You know, like I'm just getting very frustrated with this process. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, you know, after my fourth, three and a half years in Germany, four years, I remember finally getting some offers outside of Germany, but they were like to far Eastern Europe and and, and, uh, Bosnia and these other places. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. Um, I had some time, so then I came and visited. Bro, you, Glen- la- you lasted like two years outside of friggin' Utah or uh, Salt Lake City. You could do Bosnia. Yeah, you know? I know, I know. <laughs> so it, uh, anyways, it just like I had some time, and so funny enough, it was Glenn Chu who was in Hong Kong. Oh no way! He was asking me for years to come visit him. Oh, you got to come to Hong Kong. It's an awesome place. Check it out. All these things. So I ended up coming here and visiting him for two weeks. Fell in love with the city, you know, had a great time, uh, met a lot of good people. I actually was like, you know what, 
maybe it's time, you know, I was 25, 26 at the time. I was like, maybe it's time I uh, start thinking about something else and go, you know, move to Hong Kong and start something new, new path. Right. Cause I, like at this point I was pretty fed up with the whole European thing and agents and all that. So I came out here that I went home for a month and decided to move here. And then, uh, you know, started doing a couple of things. And then within a couple months of me being here, you know, I was playing for fun in some men's league or whatever, but there's actually a big basketball community here in terms of uh, men's league and, you know, Americans and expats playing. And the league was like tracked and they keep your stats and all these things. And then, you know, I was scoring like 50 and stuff and, and, and everyone's like, who's this guy? And then one day I just got a phone call from the owner of this team and he's like, hey, I heard you're here. Uh, I own this team. Would you like to meet? Um, do you have plans of staying in Hong Kong? You're like, I do now. And then basically <laughs> eight years later, eight and a half years later, here we are. I said, okay, we've been playing. And uh, through that time, you know, because of basketball, I started the academy out here and got involved in other businesses and investing and stuff like that. And now I'm still able to play and with no pressure, don't have to worry about like where my next job's going to be, get to play until I'm satisfied and, you know, get to, you know, I think I've kind of changed the culture here in Hong Kong where if other teams got more and more professional, brought in foreign coaches, you know, Nate's team, you know, they got half Canadians on their team and the foreign coach and, you know, raised the competition here significantly since I've been here. And, you know, I get to go out and try and score 40 every night against, you know, three guys trying to guard me and bad <laughs> refing. So it's, it's fun. <laughs> Just like like being back on the North Shore, man. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's been a fun time. So I mean, just I, kidding, I have referees. No just kidding, referees. We need calls this yeah. year still. Yeah, relax. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, I have no complaints. Everything's worked out. You know, very well for me. You know, I'm uh, I'm extremely grateful. Yeah, it's super cool, man. And and in a regular season with the like, say no COVID and stuff. What's it like? Yeah. Fans are great, very supportive. Like, I mean, oh yeah, the fans the are culture's unbelievable. Great. Yeah, yeah, the culture's great. You know, um, when we play our rival teams, like Nate's team and stuff like that, you know, the gym's full, it's loud, and you know, the fans are really passionate. And um, yeah, I mean, the atmosphere is super fun. And uh, yeah, I mean, it has like it's a small infrastructure right now, but it has like the room to be so big here. Um, yeah, you know. I think it's only a matter of time before they get a CBA team here again. They used to have a CBA team here for China a long time ago. And obviously mm -hmm. with all the China, Hong Kong stuff, it could, can be difficult. But I think it's only a matter of time before uh, they do have a team again. And uh, yeah, I mean, and, and Hong Kong's great. You mean, I've never seen a city with more beautiful outdoor basketball courts than Hong Kong. Like everywhere you go, there's beautiful courts. All hours of the day, people are playing like, you know, it's yeah. just, you know, you want to go out and just shoot and have a good time. Like, and the weather here is always good. It's, uh, it's pretty good. That's dope, man. And before we jump into some fun questions, you're giving back a little bit to the game, getting on the coaching yeah. side of it. How's that? You enjoying it? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, I, I enjoy working with people more, you know, one-on-one -on -one and stuff and, and, and working on skills work and stuff like that's my passion for sure. More than like coaching and coaching games and things like that. Right. Yeah. You're dealing with a little bit different kids here i mean their focus is in sports so much right mm -hmm. so it's more uh it's more for them just to get out and you know move around and be athletic but there, there's we've had some good groups over the years i've been doing it because i've been doing it for a while so it's always nice we've had a couple special groups of like you know 10 12 kids in the same age that were really focused and dedicated to it and some kids that you know they go to boarding school in the u.s for their last years of high school and ended up doing quite well um that i keep in keep in touch with so um yeah so it's, it's been good Let's have some fun questions and a light, little lightning round before we go you get your paperwork done. Sound good? Yeah, sounds great. All right, man. Uh, up to this point, who have been some of the most important people in your life? Yeah, so definitely my parents, obviously. Like I said, they've just didn't, done nothing but support me the whole time. From, like I said, the time I was three, I knew I wanted to play sports, and, and that's what it was going to be. So definitely them. they're number one. You know, you have to put Glenn up there, too, because uh, he kind of showed me the way of like he opened me up to like the idea of basketball i was already liking it but then training with him and all these things is what's kind of what really like put me over the edge and also him you know i remember at times he'd come in and you know when i was young when i was 10 11 12 and talk about this guy being like you know he's the best player in the province or that guy and like he kind of instilled that motivation in me to be like no 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 okay i, I am 
Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed that. You know, definitely my parents, definitely Glenn. Yeah. And I mean, those for sure, like the foundations, right? And then there's too many people to count along of the course. journey that uh, have been instrumental, you know? I think it's so cool too, that how it all comes around. And you know what? Haters, haters like to be haters, right? And people talked yeah. a lot about, you know, if you didn't get the chance to know Glenn, people would talk about Glenn. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. oh, wait, you didn't actually go to Argyle and he still worked with you, Tyler Kepke? Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, he yeah. was interested in developing kids, right? So I think it's refreshing and good for people to hear that, like, it was, he just wanted the game to grow. And then look at that. Who's the guy who makes the call and says, hey, man, come check this place out. I think you really like it. And eight years exactly. later. Exactly. Still yeah. here, right? So that's cool. I'll, I'll throw my JUCO coach on there too because yeah. he, like I said, he totally embraced me and built me up and just gave me, you know, the green light. And I, I kind of relay it similar to like when Jimmer was at BYU, which whom I played against for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the hardest thing, I mean, Jimmer's unbelievable, right? Unbelievable player, super skilled. But the hardest thing about playing against Jimmer was that Dave Rose, who was the coach at the time, the only thing they cared about was he was yelling at the big men to screen and rebound, right? That's all he said. But as soon as Jimmer came over half court, he was liable to shoot the ball. And then all the coach was coaching was how hard his big men screened for him and rebounded his missed shots, right? <laughs> so, like, when you have a coach like that and that's your skill set, I mean, you just – and it worked, that same thing that – what happened to me in junior college, like, Jimmer's the example in Division One, right? Like, mm-hmm. he just – Oh, yeah. It was just unbelievable what he did, right? Yeah. So I'll definitely throw my Juco coach on there for sure. Uh, you music guy? You like music? Yeah, of course. You get the best seats in the house. What concert are you going to? Dead or live? Doesn't matter. Tupac. I'm going to yes. Tupac. Yeah. That's your, yeah. That's your man, huh? Yeah, 100%. 100%. All eyes on me. Yeah. Double that's disc. Right. That's. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. That, that thing is front to back. Yeah. Who, who can put out a double disc? See, I say yeah. disc. That's how old I am. Yeah. Pac, though. All right. Yeah, yeah. I like it. I also just think the way, you know, you see videos of him, like, when he did perform and stuff, like, he, he wasn't just, a, like, a musician. He was an artist. Like, he was a performer, mm-hmm. right? Like, he just puts mm-hmm. on a show. He gets the whole crowd, you know, so I would say him. Are you a hip-hop guy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely am more of that, like, you know, 90s, genre. early 2000s okay. genre, right? Yeah. So who else, what else? So you're, uh, you're walking to your appointment today. What else? What's on? Uh, you hit Shuffle. What's another yeah. artist that's popping up for you? Well, so if more recent, like, you know, I, I used to listen to, like, you know, a lot of Southern stuff. I like, like, Jeezy and stuff like that. You know, mm-hmm. it gets me fired up mm. you know, to play and stuff. So, um, okay. you know, and Jay-Z, of course. Yeah. Jay-Z, like, his early stuff, for sure. You know, Tyler, yeah. not everyone gets this question. Not everyone gets the follow-up after that. So It's true. Oh, Usually- Really? Yeah, usually we just move on because I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm not down with that genre, but you hit me, you oh, hit okay. my genre, so I'm like, I gotta ask. Yeah, yeah. All right, Jeezy, I like it. I like yeah, it. No, I love, I love Jeezy. Good stuff. Do you read much? Yeah, big reader. Yeah. What are? You, do you have a book going right now, or is there a book all time that yeah. stands out for you that you could recommend? So right now I'm reading Atomic Habits. Ah, um, yeah, it's pretty good. James James uh, Clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm reading that right now been putting that in with my leadership class there's lots of really really good stuff there um yeah his podcast with Brene Brown is really good too I don't know if you know Brene Brown is she's like a huge like leadership person but she had him on and I was like this guy's awesome yeah you enjoying it oh yeah I'm enjoying it for sure it's it's good uh I definitely two more I'll give you is Grit by Angela Duckworth which is pretty good and then uh I like Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss where like each chapter is based on you know, a person of business, sports, doctor, and just their routine, you know, what drives them, how they do things in their daily life. So Yeah, there's like 750 pages of that too. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, a, big it's a big book. book. Yeah, it's a big book. Yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, you just got a snapshot of Tyler Kepke's brain in 30 yeah. seconds right there. The three novels yeah. he just gave you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's dope though. How do you feel about ketchup on macaroni? No. No, no dice. I don't like ketchup on anything but French fries. Like on eggs, macaroni, no dice. No. Burger? Burger, yeah. Burger, okay. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we needed that yeah. answer, just so you know. Um, yeah. Go back in time. Yeah. If there's one game for whatever reason, good, bad, in between, that you could go back to, what would it be? Uh, probably that time, because like at the time I didn't realize what I did. 
and then like the aftermath, you remember? But so I, I'm, you might remember this when we were playing at the, the HSBC, whatever tournament that was. Yeah. And we were playing at UBC. At War Memorial. I was in grade yeah. 11. I was in grade 11 and we were playing St. George's and we were down two and St. George's was inbounding under their rim. And Cam Mullet was guarding someone. He slipped and fell. I think it was Sean Anthony. And Cam Mowat threw the ball, or sorry, St. George's, the guy thought he was open, so he threw the ball, but like a long pass, and mm-hmm. I picked it off and like took one or two dribbles and pulled up from three and hit it at the buzzer to win. Mm. And I, I, I remember when it happened, like, I don't remember doing it. And I just remember the aftermath of like everyone cheering and everything. It was one of those moments where like, it was so reactive, like, you, you, you don't even feel like you're doing anything, you know? So I was mm-hmm. like, I'd like to go back to that moment. Nice. Because you are of old enough vintage, there's probably not even footage of it. So you, you would like no. to go back. Yeah, that's how old you are yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, if it man. Is, true. Sorry. Yeah, I know. Sitting here with my gray goatee, I shouldn't be taking shots. Yeah, but, yeah I got, I got um, the white hair on the side now. There so. you go. Yeah, but you have a hairline, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. You- My wife's been, she's much better looking than me and that's okay. I've, I've, oh, that's I've, all that matters, I've, yeah. I've punched up. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Well, that's not even a joke yeah. Corbs. Come on. You know, that's the truth. Um, all right. You break, you break the habits for a day. You get a bag of chips. Yeah. Any bag of chips. What are you going to? Jalapeno cheddar. Certain brand or just any, if it's jalapeno, uh, jalapeno chip, yeah. cheddar. I think it's, is it kettle? Yeah. Kettle. Yeah. Kettle chips all day. All day, every day, huh? All day, every day. Okay. Yeah. All right. A um, few more questions, man. This has been a great yeah. episode. Okay, so we got one. We said, who would you like to see on a hoops journey? Other than Javon, who I mm-hmm. I, text, I did the bad thing. I text him. I told him, I hear you're the real six god. He said, that's my brother. And he says, yeah. hey, what's up? So <laughs> yeah. he doesn't he doesn't count. Is there someone yeah. else that you'd like to see on a hoops journey that has a good story that you think you could connect us with? Let me think here. Who? Everyone, I'm trying to think of guys that I played with that would uh, be interesting. I think Andy would be interesting. Andy Routens. I have not had Andy Routens. Absolutely. I mean, Leo was the coach when I was there and Andy was playing as well. And Andy's a good guy. I think he'd be open to it. You know, he's got a cool story being Leo's kid and going to Syracuse and everything. Yeah. You know, and Andy's a good guy. So I think he'd be open to it. All right, my man. I like it. Yeah. Dope. Yeah. You've mentioned lots of names. You've played against so many different guys, but who were... As hard as it will be for you to admit, who are some dudes you're in the locker room after and you're like, damn, that guy could hoop. Like, who are, who are some of the impressive ones? Well, I'll tell you. So yeah. the first guy that where I was like, Shit, was uh, <laughs> when I was in Juco my first year. And like, literally, this was the first couple months, right? When I'm still trying okay. to figure things out. Yeah. This guy named Kenyor Williams. Okay. Kenyor Williams. He was from Newark, New Jersey. He was about 6'3", long, could jump out of the gym. Kind of like John ja, ja Morant, like that type of build and stuff. Okay. Okay. And he was he played at Mount Zion Academy, like the school that Tracy McGrady yep. went to. Okay. Yep. And he comes in, and I remember like he came in the first day of practice, and you know, thank God he turned out being a little crazy and got relieved from the team. But I remember when he first came to the first practice, I was like, "There's no way I'm playing if this guy's here." Like, just at that time, right? right. Because like I ha- I hadn't seen a guard like that, you know. In my, ever. ever, right? Like yeah. he's six three, long. He can shoot. His handle was like so tight, and he can get the ball way outside his body. Still manipulate it, you know, and then come down the lane and hammer it on guys. Like, you know, when you're seventeen, eighteen, and coming from North Van, like you, you just don't see that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And even when I, you know, went to nationals or went and played a little bit in some tournaments, like he was like bar none the best talent that I had seen, you know, at that point in my life, like in person, right? Damn. Yeah, so he he was unbelievable. Makes you think how many guys, oh, in, so like many. in the JUCO, so right? Many. Like have just come and gone that did like that, right? Like, oh, just... I mean, so many guys that don't even get to JUCO. So many guys that don't mm-hmm. get to any level of professional, right? There's there's, there's just so many. So that's why, like, no matter what the story is, if if you got to play college, if you got to play, and you know, and I'm still playing, like, you got to be grateful because you know th- there's guys that are way better than me that never you know got a chance. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you heard my story on Doug Plum's podcast uh, about like the Kobe story, right? I mean, obviously, I got to put Kobe up there too, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, you know his story about his warm well, up when we put. That doesn't mean against- that everybody's heard it, Mister Kepke. 
Okay. This okay. is a well, I'll, journey. I'll, I'll do. Yeah, I'll do the the the, the short version. It's uh, please basically we're, we're warming up. Team USA. We're playing them in Vegas. You know, all the guys are out there. It's like two hours before the game or whatever. We're out there shooting, and and most of their guys are out there. And then Kobe comes out, and Kobe comes out. And right, right away, you just sense the energy. The, uh, the, 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 the head of the, the lion is here, right? Mm. And he comes out. And I just remember all the other U.S. players and, and everyone was there. Okay, like everyone was there. Big name. They all left the court, went back to the locker room while Kobe worked out for like 20, 30 minutes with the trainer. Like got in his like skill warm-up shooting workout by himself. And then they all came back out to warm up together. And then during the game, I just remember, so, you know, I played with Carl English and Kobe and him had an ongoing little rift because like the year before, Carl talked a little to him or something. And then uh, in this game, I remember Carl coming down and like catching Kobe and Carl, you know, Carl was, could shoot the hell out of the ball, but you know, he's six, five, super slow, weird crossover, but he catches people with it. I still to this day, you know, don't know how he did, does it, but he came down the court and caught Kobe with this big left to right cross and Kobe bit hard, you know, and the whole crowd and the Thomas and Mac, like you just heard them. I don't know if, Carl, I can't remember if Carl made the shot or not, but the point was is they come back running down the court and you can see Carl's like in Kobe's ear. And I mean, give it to Carl. Carl's a fearless guy, right? Like he, he he's like me, like he thinks he can put 40 on everyone, no matter what, right? <laughs> And and then all you hear the next like five times down the court is Kobe like yell, get me the ball, right? And him just going to the block and no matter who had the ball, got him the ball and he literally scored five times in a row, like just posted up whoever was guarding him just like clockwork, you know? So, so I definitely got to awesome. Kobe on that list. Yeah. And what's Carl like after the game? Just like. No, Carl. I mean, Carl's I mean, a hilarious guy, right? Yeah. Like he's. He, I mean, it's he's Kobe. a funny guy. Yeah, it's you Kobe. Have I mean, some, but you Carl, have someone light you up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I don't even think Carl was guarding him most of the time though on those. But you know, Carl. I mean, like I said, Carl's fearless and and he, he goes at everybody and you know, um, you have to respect it. You know. Yeah, man. Last question, brother. This has been awesome. Um, thanks for taking the time out of your day to no, be with us. A great story and and lots of good stuff. Um, up to this point, you know, you're still hooping, doing your thing, but. The last question we ask every guest is if you could do it all again, you would what? Yeah, I would I would go play three years of Division One. Most important. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a regret or is it just kind of like if you could do it again? I would say a would... regret because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, for for Quinn and, you know, I have the tattoo on my chest. So we have no regrets, right? Mm-hmm, but uh, mm-hmm. I'm not going to say it's a regret. It's just reflecting, you know, if you were to make a change, um, you know, I would change that. But then again, at the same time, you know, my life's turned out pretty good. So, you know, if I made that change, you never know where you end up, right? So, I, yep. like I said, I have no complaints. I'm uh, extremely grateful and that's, that's what it is. Sometimes it'd just be fun to go on the time machine and just see, right? Just see, oh, what's, yeah. see what's happening at that point, you know? Well, I know, <laughs> I know. It's, uh, it's hard not to do that, right? For sure. Continued success, man. Any last comments, reflections before we let you go? Amazing Hoops journey. And uh, we wish you nothing but the best overseas and stay healthy. And, and we hope that that season gets going again for you. Yeah, thank you. No, I'll, the one piece of advice I'll give for all the young people out there, not just basketball players, but whatever athlete is, it's never as bad as you think it is, right? So if you're in the game and, and you just turned it over twice, you, people that you know you, you really think everyone's looking at you and you know you, you may it's the end of the world but like if you learn to like train yourself to understand it's never as bad as you think it is i mean steph curry just shot three air balls the other night against memphis you know the mm-hmm. best shooter in the world steph curry's gone one for 10 0 for 10 before so as long as like i think young players and athletes they, they they lose that perspective they put so much pressure on themselves and and you know the coaches and all these things but if you keep that perspective like i think it will help People keep a level head when they're playing. Love it, man. It's a good way to end yeah. it. A great, great a Hoops Journey episode. One of the, I don't know, I don't want to disrespect by saying forgotten about or slept on guys, but a no, guy no. that has, has has worked his ass off to get where he is and has crazy success. And when you go back and think about the things that he was able to do on the basketball court and is still doing as not quite an old man yet, but he's getting there. No. Um, Good in there. An inspiration to many and an absolute legend and a BC legend. So thanks for being with us, man. No, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Great you got time. it. Shout out to uh, Parkside Brewery, Good Light Clothing, and we will see you all on the next episode.
kind of also propelled me when I made the team as a younger guy on the U17 provincial team when I was an all-star at nationals was Rich Goulet. So rest in peace, Rich. He uh, he was instrumental. Um, and I know he still told stories about me to people, you know, saying that I, in his eyes at the same age, I was better than Nash. And a lot of people have told me that that was his uh, thing. He told a lot of people. So I forgot to mention him, but uh, I just wanted to say his name because, uh, yeah, he he was instrumental in my development as well. So Cap K. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's no, a he, legend, man. Yeah, I love. We're him. still recording. He, uh, we'll get him in there. Corbs will. That'll be a good yeah. cold intro, Corbs. Yeah, he's already thinking. Yeah, yeah. 